we are live. So first of all, I'd like to say welcome back to the workshop to all of those out there that are watching the replay of this video and all the guys that are just coming into the live stream. Thank you all for being here this evening. Tonight we are going to be working on our vise. We are going to be finishing up this little barbell here. Uh, I'll go to the anvil cam here in just a minute after a little bit once we get some people in here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So now comes the fateful day where we are going to weld up the other end of this barbell. Uh, it almost feels like a cardinal sin right now at this point with as pretty as this looks, although this is rough filed uh, and it still needs quite a bit of work, it still feels like a cardinal sin to stick something that's that shiny back in the fire just to get it all scaled up again. So. But that's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to make a nice little uh, forge weld, little collar weld here uh, in the same fashion that we did the other barbell, but with the increased complexity because now it has to go th pass through the actual screw portion of our vise and get welded up. So I've got a little miniature swedge block sitting on the forge right now, and that will be the second thing that we do. Right now this thing's kind of warming up by the fire here, so it's going to be nice and warm so it doesn't rob any heat out of the little tiny uh, collar weld that we're going to try to accomplish tonight. So when we get to that, that'll be great. But the first thing we're going to start with is actually we're going to cut out the cheek pieces for the vise. And let's go over to the anvil cam real quick. Jess? Alright. Okay, by the way, everybody say hi to Jess if you see her up there. Hey everybody. Uh, yeah, hello, hello. So. Uh, so we've got some pieces here. Basically, we are going to work on these little cheek pieces here. And I've got these all perfectly laid out right now. Uh, and I know you may not be able to see them that well on camera, all the little layout dots there. But basically, we're going to take and chisel across here, and we're going to chisel these out. We're going to chisel out what will become our cheek pieces that this hinges from. So it'll hold them together, right? So we gotta have cheek pieces there. So that's what we're gonna be doing. And this here, I went ahead and filed this up too. Uh, this is the nut. This is the back portion of the vise. So that's been all filed up, but that'll have to be drilled and tapped. And this will obviously still have to be threaded in order for those two pieces to go together like so. Mm -hmm. So that's it on that. So we will get to the actual weld a little later on in the stream. We're going to do the chiseling first and get that out of the way to get those pieces out of the way. So I'll get that in the fire and get those heated up. Uh, just for your information, this is a piece of eighth inch plate, or I believe three mil uh, thick plate, and it's two inches across or 50 mil. And then I went uh, roughly about an inch and a quarter. So I'm not sure what that is, 25, uh, 32 mil. Yeah, I think that's about right. Mm -hmm. Somewhere right around there, right around like 32 mil is what I went here long. So it's like inch and quarter, inch and three eighths, somewhere in there, I forget the measurement. But that's what those are, and then I divvied it in half, so this way it's 25 mil tall or one inch tall. Mm -hmm. So we'll get that in the fire real quick. Those are the measurements. Keep those in mind because if somebody asks you later in the stream, somebody asks you later in the stream what the measurements were, everybody can give them the measurements. And I don't have to repeat them that way. Yeah. So, all right. So, who do we have in the stream, hon, while we all get this right. first heat up here? Yeah, yeah, let me tell you who's in here. And uh, by the way, uh, go ahead and let us know if our audio and video is looking all good and yep. if it syncs and everything. Give us some thumbs up or audio good or check or whatever you want to say. All right, we have uh, Dylan Gaming. He says hi. Dylan Gaming, hello. Good to have you in the house. Charles Nowiski says good evening. Good evening, Charles. Good to have you. We have Ben Toombs, Coffee Forge. Ben Toombs, Coffee Forge. Always good to see regulars here. Donald Roberts, Martin Elam. Donald Roberts, hello, Martin. Let's see, uh, Keith Dever says howdy, y'all. Kentucky, I'm all ears. Taking a break from fortune cards for Mother's Day. Haha, uh -huh, good. Yep, got to do that. So. You know what? You want to hear something bad? I haven't even made Jess get anything for Mother's Day. So. Well, technically that's the kid's job, and they've been yeah. on it. So. so, technically, what I'll probably do is I'll just give her my love. That's it. <laughs> so, I know it's not worth much, but 
It's what she's getting this Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you for the Mother's Day wishes, Chris Balding. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Corey Shire, I'm doing well. Andrew Freeman, again, thank you for the Happy Mom's Day. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Let's see, uh, Herb Page says, what's up? Well, in my area, there was flooding and was cut off from town for five days, LOL. Oh, no. <laughs> that ain't no good. <laughs> that is quite a while. That is a pretty bad flood there, I would say. Get these set out of the way for the time being. We'll revisit them later. Dustin Dixon says, can't stick around. It's my niece's birthday today. She's 11. Okay, Dustin Dixon, but thanks for stopping by anyhow. Tell her happy birthday from the Adams family. Let's see. Uh, Keith Dever says, better get on it, buddy. LOL. <laughs> Ben Toon says, forgot the measurements already, lol. <laughs> well, you're hosed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the replay's for, right? Yeah, that's what the replay's <laughs> for. Go off and watch the notes. replay. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sorry, just getting stuff orchestrated here. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it looks like we're doing good. It looks like everybody's funneling in. Good, good. Uh, they say the audio is, looks good. Um, good, good. On our end, it looks like there's a little bit of a delay, but as long as the audio syncs up, I guess it's not an issue. Okay. They said so. there is a delay? Or? It seems like there's a little bit of a lag, yeah. On our end? Uh, yeah, just from the uploading. Um, okay, we well, that's here. that's on us. So hopefully everybody else, there's no lag or anything like that. Cool. Yeah, we got 37 watching so far. Good, good, good. Techromatic says, good morning all, lol. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Techromatic. Yeah, it's just warming up here, so probably in like Australia, it's just starting to get cool. It's like their yeah. fall weather. Probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we're good and hot, so um, we need to take go to the ample cam here, and we'll start chiseling this out. Okay. Are you there? Yep, we're there. Alrighty. So I've got a slit chisel here, and basically I'm just going to find all my little marks here and just go across them. Now for those who are worried about me damaging Olga, trust me, we'll put a cut plate on here before we get that far along. Right now, all I'm focusing on doing is getting my layout done. Now you could take and saw this out if you wanted to, but this is a little more traditional of a way of doing it. And plus, not everybody has a nice upright band saw. Yes, you can do it with a chisel. So I'm just getting my little layout done while it's still kind of hot. see that just fine. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we've got our layout marked. Now we'll come back through, heat this up again, 
This time, I'll throw down a sacrificial plate, just so this way, you know, we're not taking and cutting into anything. So I'll set down a scrap piece of eighth inch plate, and then cut all the way down through the ample. Now, I'm going to cut out here first, and get those little nubs out of there, and then I'm going to split the pieces, and then sever them from the bar stock. Because if you don't cut out here, you're going to, well, you'll regret it. You'll be chasing this little piece all over the place. Right now we have a handle. If I were to cut this off first, then we don't have a handle to work with. So make sure you cut out here at your ends if you're following along with this whole little process. But there we go. There's, those are laid out. We'll get it back heated up. All right. Some of us, uh, let's see, some of the viewers just joining are asking what you are making, such as Joshua K and... Okay. Jason. So what I'm making tonight, what the main principle of this live stream is going to be, will be we will be forge welding the other barb or the other ball portion of the barbell for our screw for a little vise that we're making. Uh, this is just a continuization of an entire series I've been doing on this uh, little forge device here, filer's vise, hand vise. Uh, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it a prison's vice. Um, we've been doing what? I don't know how many live streams we've got on it now. We've got a bunch on it. So, But uh, yeah, we're finally getting to forge welding this up, which is the next step in the process in order for us to actually thread the rest of this rod uh, and be able to actually thread it and then do the nut and get the vice actually operating. So the piece that I'm working on just now is the cheek pieces of the hinge of the vise. So this way you actually have the hinge joint. Uh, they call them the cheeks. Uh, some of you would just call them the hinge plates. You can call it whatever you like, but uh, that's basically what we're doing this evening. Anthony. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Anthony Chase has caught you forging again. That you did, Anthony. <laughs> Seems like that's what I do a lot of. <laughs> All right, so a uh, couple quick tips. Whenever you're working with anything small like this and you're going to be doing any sort of forge welds on small stuff, uh, anytime you're working with anything at all, really, in the blacksmith shop, it's very important to take and have uh, your process orchestrated very well. So picture yourself as being the maestro, okay? And, you know, this is like your string quartet kind of thing of stuff that you're going to be working on, the woodwind section. I'm not a, I'm not a aficionado when it comes to opera or anything like that. But basically, you want to have everything orchestrated just right. You want your tools where they need to be. If you're missing tools and they're halfway across the shop, go get them while it's still heating up. Things like that. Have all that out in place so you can make the most of your heat. When the fire, when you pull the piece out of the fire. So, any questions before I pull this out? Sure. Uh, Graham says, Roy, I finished 26 tulips with just stems and seven that have stands. Hopefully, the weather gets a bit warmer. Please pray for no rain. Woohoo! Okay, praying for no rain for Graham. And you are a tulip factory, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good thing. So, um, yeah, so real quick before I go ahead and pull this out, which we are hot, so we'll be pulling that out in just a second. Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for all their support uh, that had purchased Jessica. Isn't that right, Jessica? Yeah. Jessica's okay. Blacksmith Cheat Sheet. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Um, for those that don't know what that is, there should be links in the description down below. Yep. Uh, you can go check that out. Jessica, why don't you tell them just a little bit more about okay, it? Sure. So. Yeah, it's got 50 different projects in it, mm -hmm. and it's got the keywords, the pricing, variations, uh, anything that you would need to know to sell it online. And some people mentioned that this would be just really handy for selling locally, even to know the variations and kind of the pricing and things like that. So I did put a little, a lot of work into researching it, and the download is $10, and the link's down in the description like Roy mentioned. Yeah, so thank you all so much for everybody who's been buying those. That really does help out. Uh, and that makes that makes us doing those sort of things very sustainable. So we greatly appreciate it. Thank you all very much. So uh, also here just a little bit, we'll go ahead and say our thank yous to everybody who supported us in last week's live stream 
and for the last past month on the you know super chat donations. Uh, we greatly appreciate each and every last one of you. And uh, and we actually have a little special gift that we're going to be giving away this live stream uh, to somebody who uh, did a super chat last live stream. So stay tuned for who that is. And then also we'll we'll jump over. Maybe Jess will do that. I don't know if you got that set up to yeah, jump yeah. over to the Blacksmith Cheat Sheet mm -hmm. and show them that. We'll do that a little later on. But okay. enough of us yammering. All Let's right. get to the anvil, Jess. Let's see the anvil. Go ahead. And while I'm cutting on this, you can go ahead and read some comments. Yep, read some comments. All right. Anthony Chase says, "Oh, look, picture in picture. You guys are getting good at this." We're trying, Anthony. Penny Brown says, "Hello, I just subbed to you. I was watching your video on heat treating chisels, which I will be trying soon." Awesome, Penny Brown. Thank you for subscribing. Glad to have you a part of the channel. Andrew Freeman says, Hey guys, I just got my first coal forge on Monday, but I still need a blower. Any chance the hand cook blower build will be coming soon? Uh, that is something I want to put on the docket within the next month or two. Uh, I wouldn't hold your breath that that'll be the thing. I'm getting quite packed up here. Uh, but... Just for you, I'll see what I can do. How's that sound? John and Stuart Alistair says hello from Surrey, BC, Canada. Hello, hello. Keith Dever says I need to get back to my forge. Mother's Day is almost here. See you later. Okay, we'll see you, Keith Devers. Thanks for stopping by. I don't remember when you publish the plans for things that you have made do you include the video name date or how we can review the streams or videos if I'm asking this correctly uh, yes John actually if you go to blacksmithpdfs.com and you click on any one of the listings um, they all do have a if there's been a video made on it the link is in the description for that particular plan yep oh. all right you still look there at the anvil mm -hmm. so there we go we got our first two notches cut out I've got a little bit of a nib here that I need to cut out just on this side to round that off a little bit better and then I can go ahead and part the two and then cut it off the bar stop. Alright. Coffee Sports says he wants, he wants rain here so that he can see his uh, 160 acres of corn poking out of the earth. <laughs> Rain can be a very good thing if you're a farmer. And then it can also be your worst nightmare, <laughs> depending on how well your tiling job is. Uh, Keith Dever says, use a hair dryer for a blower for now. Oh yeah, he was talking about the blower yeah, before, yeah. yeah. Donald Roberts says, have to check my blood sugar. I burnt my fingertips earlier. Gave me blisters. Not to Note to self, if you drop something on the floor that is hot, don't try to pick it up with your fingers. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. That would be the best advice you could have right there. Jim Bob Van Taylor says, howdy, y'all. Jim Bob, good to have you in the house. Howdy, howdy. Mike G, good to have you. That might be. All right. So who's all enjoying the stream so far? Hopefully you guys are still enjoying it. Yeah, we got 47 watching. Awesome, awesome. We're going to get to the neat part here in just a few minutes. Um, well, bring it up to Wild and Heat, do all that, and discuss what we're going to be doing, and uh, it's going to be good stuff. All right. What else, Jess? Anybody else? All right. Come sure. Let's see. Oh, Coffee Sports says they put in new tile last year out in the cornfield. Okay, well then you ought to be set. They did a good job. They've done some tiling around here, but they did a horrible job. Um, so a lot of the fields still flood out around here. But that's why I'm a blacksmith, not a farmer. All right, Jess, let's go to the floor. Go to the anvil. Cut off. One of the 
of the benefits to hot cutting these off is you get this really nice looking chamfer on the pieces. And that chamfer you can accentuate with a file. And I better go pick that up real quick. There we go. Sorry, that was an emergency. Landed on the oxyacetylene hoses. That means I'll have to get a new pair of those. All right. So now that's all been cut off of. I don't know what camera you're on now, but uh, main cam. Yep. There you go. All right. So I will have to go over there. I have to grab up my little pieces here. Mm -hmm. Give me a real quick sec, and I'll get my tongs on them. Jim Bob Van Taylor says, howdy, Adam's family. Y'all doing well? I see the weather's doing us all some good. Yes, it is. Doing us all good. Although it could be a little colder, would be just fine by me. Yeah, like a, like a high of 70 might be nice. <laughs> One piece. Robert Wagner says, in the Midwest, we get rid of the water as fast as we can. <laughs> Mark S says, only one fire in the shop. Yep. Yeah, only one. That's all we want in the shop. Especially tonight. RC Development says, hello from Western Australia. Hello, RC Development. Good to have you in from Australia. Lone Wolf's Voice says, have you or anyone else tried those little blue forge blowers that you can pick up for about 50 bucks and do they work decently well? Um, there's, uh, I have not used them personally, uh, and I've had mixed reviews of those. I've heard mixed reviews. So I wouldn't know what to tell you on those as far as quality. Uh, some say they're great little blowers, and then some say not so great. So, um, for their price, you can't do a lot of complaining. Uh, for their price, basically put. If you're needing something hand crank, you don't want to listen to a noisy leaf blower or a hair dryer, uh, you can't beat the price because, I mean, good luck picking up a Champion 400 blower for cheap. It's not going to happen. So, um, if you're in a pinch and you need a hand crank blower, then that's what I'd go with for sure. Couldn't recommend the quality though. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Tucker and Maddox says cords and hoses are magnets for hot steel. Yes, they are. Uh, usually it's not a problem in my shop. I'm being very careful of the way I point things right now. Uh, it's either going towards Jessica or very expensive camera equipment, and so I'm choosing elsewhere in my shop that I normally wouldn't point the hot steel when I'm cutting it off. So, But uh, that's how that works. <laughs> Erin Coughlin says, just shut down my forge time to see how the pros do it. Smiley face. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm pro enough for you, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, let's go over the anvil real quick, Jess. I'm going to show these little things. Okay. So there you go. Just like the two, just like the Ten Commandments there. <laughs> little tablets. <laughs> little tablets, right? So those will become our cheek pieces. I'll show you how those look here real quick. So again... You've got your vise, it's like so. So the cheek pieces are going to go on like so, roughly. And I'll have to have a little bit of a little bit of trim up here. It'll have a little bit of trim up here when I get it done, all said and done. But they'll go on here like so, and they'll also be filed. So they'll be filed and there'll be a little bit of a decorative filing in detail, but that creates those cheek pieces like what you see on vices. So that way that can go like that. Okay? Okay. And there'll be two of them. So we got those done. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, you guys, uh, if you can, take a moment and share this stream with somebody. Yep. Uh, we normally run until about 9 o'clock. So we have about an hour and a half still to go.
Wow, I got that done in 30 minutes. You did. Wow, we. Okay. I need to start dragging my feet, right? Oh, no. Oh, uh, if we don't go a full two hours, then, you know, we just don't do a full two hours. So we'll have to see how this gets up there. Um, I'm not in, I'm not one for lallygagging in the heat here, right next to the forge. So it's been quite spicy today. So we'll see where we're at here in about another 30 minutes. Never know. Okay. Might be an hour before we get it done. Yeah. All right, what else? Let's one more, a couple more questions before I start explaining again. Okay, sure. Uh, our scene development says I did my first festival last weekend and I also got some commissions from it. That's awesome. You can't beat commissions coming from festivals because that means they're already hooked to your product, which is good. That's what you want. More. No, I said a few more okay. questions. Right. There we go. Uh, Earth H says we had record-breaking <laughs> flood level this spring in my area. Don't want to hear about rain or snow melt for a while. Oh <laughs> Yeah, if you had record-breaking floods, I suppose that would make you go that way. Just a wee bit. Laura Kennedy says, do you have a preference between coal and coke forges or gas forge, and are there many pros or cons for either? Uh, there's a ton. Depending on who you ask, pros and cons for either. Uh, I do not personally, I do not personally prefer specifically one tool over another in my shop. I do it for a profession, and so therefore, uh, there are some people who say, "Oh, you know, you got to be if you're going to be a professional, you got to have a gas forge." That's just bupkis. Uh, there are other people who say, "If you, you know, you're going to be a professional, you got to have a coal forge." That's just bupkis. Uh, none of that matters. Uh, basically, a forge is a tool. Forge is a tool. There's ups and downsides to, bo to both. Uh, coal forges, they're nice, green coal or coke, because your fire can change in size and dimension and shape based upon the object you're trying to put in it in heat. Downside to that is, is it doesn't stay nice and pretty and open like a gas forge would with a big old heating chamber in there that you just throw stuff in mindlessly. You have to maintain it in order for it to work for you. Gas forges, they have a very limited opening. They are built for whatever size you can do. There's not a one-all beat-all gas forge. I don't care how big you make it, you can make it so insanely huge then you're heating dead airspace to work on little tiny quarter inch rod stock. So it's a waste of time. Um, but then there's times where you need to throw in a couple, three, four, five big billets of steel. That's where a, co a coal forge or a coke forge isn't as nice as a gas forge because you can just throw the billets in, pull one right after the other out for production. So uh, like I said, there's a lot of ups and downs depending on where you're at. If you're in the country, coke or coal is great. If you're in the city, not so much. You'll have the cops called on you uh, or fire departments sometimes unless you like really like bake your neighbors some pies and stuff. Um, and then if it's a uh, gas forge, you know, they're loud. They roar. So I haven't met a quiet gas forge yet. And uh, after a long day in front of a gas forge, I can tell you they'll cook you quite a bit more than a coal or coke forge will. So that's my thoughts on that. All right. Any more? Good. Three. One last one. Okay. Let's go. Jim Bob the Impact says, Y'all go with the LED lights in the shop? Question mark. It looks very nice. Yep. We went with the good old fashioned LED lights. So we've got one more to put in. I need one more about right in this area that you guys can't see there, but that would help even out some of the colors and stuff in here. Uh, I did have some fluorescent ones before, but they buzz and hum. And then I had some yellowish bulbs that were the wrong Kelvin color, and it gave everything like an orangish, grungy hat uh, cast to the shop, which I didn't like. So, yeah. So, all right. So, I'm going to explain what we're going to be doing here. Uh, I'm going to go over the anvil for that. Okay, so basically what we've got here is we've got just a piece of half-inch round 
mild steel bar stock that we drilled a quarter inch hole all the way through because that's what this shank is. That doesn't have to be exact. Whatever this is, obviously that's the hole you're going to put in this. Uh, and then I took a cube of material or essentially half inch long cut of this and then drilled it pretty much. And so this is going to become our little collar piece. It slips on there just like so and it'll get welded in. Uh, now this, contrary to the way that we made these collars, this we didn't just wrap around and have a scarf weld on the outside. This here is going to just be a compression type weld. And that you can do this and get away with this. Uh, it does take a little bit more of a trick because you don't want to overwork this joint until it's fully welded because it can pull itself apart. And uh, so that's what we'll be working on now is getting this welded in. So we, first things first, we've got to get this good and hot. We've got to sprinkle a little bit of flux on it and we'll be making our first initial weld over the swedge block at the cold forge. Now you all won't be able to take and see it over there, uh, the greatest, but basically I'm welding in a swedge that fits this. So this way I can pull it out, get it in the swedge, it supports it from the underside on three sides from underneath, and I can hammer on the top side and get that weld to compress together, okay? If you try to do this on the flat of the anvil, it is possible, but what ends up happening is you stick it in this direction and it pops loose in this direction. So you gotta have a swedge in order to do this, right? It's a swedge block that goes in the hardy hole of your anvil, or it's an actual swedge block, um, or anything like that. Now, if you can make a swedge block, like I made this one, over here on the coal forge. If you can make it, I've got a video on the channel about that. But if you can make one small enough, you can actually set it right on the forge and you don't waste any heat coming from welding heat out of the fire, right up to your swedge, give it a couple taps and right back in the fire. Uh, and it allows you to be able to take in forge weld much more efficiently small material like this. So that's what we'll be doing there. The next step, we will actually come over to the anvil and I'll be using this little miniature stake anvil to, so I can get the distance between here and here. So I can get between there so I can back it up as I hammer this way to weld in the end. And then after that we'll round it up. We'll get it somewhat semi round and then later on when we do some filing on it and stuff it'll look like this one here. Like what we did on the other side. Hopefully all that's in shot and in view pretty well and everybody can see it. Good? Yeah, good. All right. So let's get in the forge and get it hot. All right. Ben Toom says, I just got asked to make a custom made K-bar for hunting and camping. It's cool when I can sit down with the guy and let him draw the shape that he wants and all the options. Oh yeah. Is there any questions? to the vice, Jess. All right, let me look for that. Uh, Graham, we appreciate the $2 super chat. Thank you, Graham. Per your usual, sir. Greatly appreciate that. Um, let's see. Uh, no, no, comment, no questions about the vice just yet. Okay. What's going on, then? All right. Um, the payment I won, your cousin, right? Hi guys. Hey Roy, what size t-shirt is that? Looks like you've lost some weight there, buddy. <laughs> well, it's actually just one size bigger. I think this is what, Jess? It's a this large. is large. This is a large. So, so this is a large shirt. Um, I have lost a little bit of weight, not a ton, but but that's my goal anyhow. I'm hoping to get down some weight. I used to be a little thinner than what I am now, by about 20 pounds. So, trying to drop that. We'll see how it goes. But this is an old-fashioned kind of shirt. They're called a Scully shirt, and I believe you got a link to that, don't you? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, she's got a link to one of those in the description down below, don't you? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, under our Amazon influencer page. Yep. And those are affiliate links, by the way. If you click on any of the links in the description down below, uh, they are affiliate links. They go to help the channel. If you decide to purchase through those links, we get a small little kickback, which is uh, fairly small. When I say small, it is small. <laughs> but every bit counts. Help the channel moving forward. Evan Coughlin says, 
Actually, where do you get ideas for products and how long it takes from idea to selling them? Um, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Myself, it comes basically my ideals for products are just things I want to make uh, in general or something that I have in my mind to do. That's usually my ideals for products. My, my ideals for products or projects of any kind, they mainly come from things that I'm interested in making. Okay. Uh, sometimes I'll see somebody else has done something, I'm like, well that's neat, but it would have been a lot better if they would have done this. And then I make it and I go my own totally different route with it, and I'm like, yeah, I think I could probably sell these. And that's how that product comes out of it. Um, you know, when it comes to actually making a sale, uh, it could be up to a year before something sells. It just depends on whether you're actually doing any market research or not. If you're doing research, and if you're doing a good job and doing your homework like you should be before you're trying to push for a sell or something like that, then you will know what's already selling, so to speak, or what will be good. And then all you have to do is worry about making it in your own styling. And then that is a good way of uh, cutting the curve off of, you know, fire and forget and hopefully it will hit something, right? Like, mm -hmm. So that's a good way of reducing that learning curve there. So this is hot. Right. Let me go ahead and flux it here. Oh, yo. Get my flux on here. Switch hammers. So I'll just flux it over here at the floor. It's basically, I'm just using some 20 mule team borax. Nothing special about this. It is just your standard 20 mule team stuff. Now you'll notice I'm not brushing this, and there is no need in brushing this, because basically what the flux does is it eats the scale, because it's a boric acid, and it takes in, when it eats at the scale, it actually will carry that scale out of the joint, out of the actual weld joint itself through capillary action. So there's no point in coating or caramelizing uh, your pieces to no end with flux because that does not, that doesn't ensure that you're going to get a weld. It's not a candy coating. It's not blocking out any oxygen and junk like that. It is meant to dissolve scale at a high temperature. The boric acid runs off the scale via capillary action through the weld joint and when you pop it, it carries that scale out of the joint. It does not prevent oxygenation. Uh, over oxygenating your fire, bringing it up to a really high oxygen environment, that will, that will burn the piece or heavily scale the piece and so therefore you don't want to do that. But uh, Actual flux will not do anything to prevent that. It's a boric acid. So it's meant, and because it being an acid, that's another good point to point out. You don't want to be breathing in the vapors of this stuff. Uh, you know, you want to flux it, flux it near your vent hood, or if you're fluxing in the shop, just, you know, don't put your head over it, you know, uh, because it is an acid and it can irritate your upper respiratory system. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Corey Shire says, wouldn't that shirt look good with the logo st stitched across the back of it? Yes, it would. Jeff Stanley says, hi, Roy and Jeff. And all sliding in home a little late trying to get the AC running. A little warm here in Texas. Yeah, it's been a little warm in Ohio. Not as warm as in Texas, I'm sure. She's definitely got to get that AC going. Tis the time of year. Rob Archer says, hi guys, just wanted to say thank you very much for doing all the videos that you do. It really helps us beginners out quite a bit and have a good night. Hey, you have a good night too. It's our pleasure. Thank you for stopping in the live chat for a little bit. All right, so I'm going to be watching this thing like a hawk because you can go from welding to 
way too hot dripping on stuff that's this small real quick. with it and drown it, you can actually you can actually cause the weld not to stick because you put too much flux on that and it'll get in between the surfaces and a lot of people they have a problem with properly scarfing their joints and if they don't get that scarf just perfect to where it blows out the flux it gets a flux it gets an inclusion in it and then it pops apart the joint at a later date. So you can actually bake that flux on there. Again, you're supposed to just throw it on. It's supposed to eat away at the scale, uh, not just be a caramel topping. If you want caramel topping, go get you an ice cream sundae. Mm -hmm. Graham says this piece looks hard to weld, and even keeping it in view of not losing it. Yep, this is a... Uh, if you want difficulty level for forge welding, on a scale of 1 to 10, this is probably a solid 8. So uh, it is quite a difficult weld to make because, one, it's small. Two, not only is it small, but it's got an extra big dangly piece hanging off of it. So it's kind of counterintuitive. It's not really, you know, it's not just a straight piece. It's actually got an extra, it's a T in and of itself, right? The third thing that makes it difficult is that it is a collar weld. And collar welds are a, a more difficult weld to obtain because there's a lot of surface area around this uh, conical shape that you're trying to get welded in. And so that makes it even harder. This isn't the hardest weld to do, but it's definitely up there. Ben Toon says, have you tried anhydric boric acid, or do you just like the normal? I have tried a little bit of it. Uh, I forget what brand it was. It wasn't mine, so I can't really say if, I, if there was anything wrong with it, if the guy had it or whatever. Uh, but basically, my knowledge of it is it's just borax with moisture baked out, so you can do it yourself on a cooking sheet in your oven. It's just lots with moisture baked out. Uh, my thought process on that and from what I found is uh, boric acid or borax, it loves moisture. So the second you bring it out of that oven and you put it in your little snuff can or whatever and then it's like you go to use it in your shop and it's been humid and all this other stuff, unless that's a sealed container, it's just going to absorb that moisture back to it, um, to itself. Now, this guy, he had some pieces, it almost looked like it was turning gray, like a gray ash instead of black like it was supposed to be. And so, uh, I don't know if that's really a point or not. I didn't see any increase in weldability. But then again, I'm just a straight 20 mule team borax guy. I've been using it since I started, and it's what I'm most comfortable with using. So, All right, so I'm going to bring this out and make this weld here. It's pretty much welded. Uh, I'm going to be right at the forge, and I hopefully you guys can kind of see an overview here. Yeah, we can see the top. Okay. The I just have to do this quick. I know it won't be movie magic, but it's more important that I get the weld stuff than it to be the perfect camera angle. welded, throw a little more flux on it, doesn't really need it, but we'll just give it to it anyhow, put it back in the fire. So that's been welded. Very anticlimactic. <laughs> I saw a few sparks. 
Yep. Those sparks that you saw that come off of there, um, and if you see any sparks, that should be the steel interacting with the oxygen in the air when you're pulling it from an oxygen-free environment. It should not come out firing off like a firecracker with sparks. If it's doing that, if it's firing off like a sparkler and it's like going real crazy, you have too high of oxygen content inside your fire at a high temperature. You need to reduce the amount of oxygen that you have by cutting off the blower and letting it ramp down and have that chance to be a reducing fire, a reducing oxygen or a reducing flame type environment in there in order for it to weld good. Penny Brown asks, is there any 412 pieces you would suggest starting off with example basket twist, etc.? Uh, let's see here. The simplest forge weld piece that if you want to take and do something just to say that you forge welded, uh, you can take a 3 8 inch rod, draw just a little point on it, and just lap it back on itself and forge weld it into itself and make a poker. Um, you can do some meat skewers that way and some other things like some like larger po fire pokers. If you're good, you can do it on a little small stock like meat skewers. You can just bend it around and just weld it in. Um, that's a great thing to do for like a forge welded piece, so to speak. Uh, if you want to do basket twist stuff, that's not too bad as long as you get your bundle tight and everything to start with. Uh, that's a great one as well. Um, you know, again, you have to think that you're not welding just two flat planes together at that point. You're welding multiple, multiple bars or whatever those are called, con convexed surfaces. You're welding multiple convex surfaces together with a gap and airspace in between. So you have to give it enough time that those can mush and mend together um, and weld in well together. John Tompkins says, they talk a lot about flux burning out gas forge bricker lining. How does it affect the fire pot in a coal forge? Doesn't at all. Um, mainly put where it will affect a coal forge, and you know, maybe before I say not, doesn't at all, proper maintenance of your coal forge will not allow it to have a problem, so to speak. It won't wear out the cast iron. Um, but what it will do is it will, however, if you flux inside the forge, and there's cases where that's necessary, that you have to do that, but if you flux inside the forge, it grabs, again, it's a cleaning agent, it's a boric acid, it's going to dra drag all the impurities to the bottom of that air grate on you. And you're going to get this big, nasty, gnarled up clinker at the bottom of your uh, coal forge when you do that. Now, that can build up so bad, and I've seen it, where guys have been running it for so long and hollow fires and stuff like that, that it actually jams the air grate and it'll eat out the, the actual where the air holes come through, the air grate itself. It'll actually eat that away. Um, and it'll plug up, and you'll have to get a chipping hammer in there and bust it out, and it'll almost be like, like a heavy cutting slag in a way at the bottom of the forge. Uh, Tech we appreciate the $5 super chat. Thank you, Tech appreciate that. Among the 12, yes, we have uh, several moderators now. Graham Pepper is one of them. Uh, Mike G. We've got a couple. Yep. Rock Mike says, of all the things I filled out in blacksmithing, forge welding is the one thing I've always had success with. Go figure. <laughs> Manga 12 says, I worked on that piece of steel I was hammering on last year to try and make a crowbar or chisel yesterday. That's a long couple year project there, isn't it? Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, RC Development says he uses welders, uh, build, builder sand. Yup. That has to be put on quite hot, almost at a welding heat. Uh, Evan Coughlin says it's a waste of time to bake out the borax unless your forge is turned off, the moisture won't stick, stick around for long. Yeah. So 
sorry, I'm trying to keep my eyes on yeah. this here. Yeah, sure you have that good. Uh, Rock Mike, I know why I have success. I listen to Roy, lol. <laughs> Appreciate that, Rock Mike. Appreciate that. So, so when this comes up to heat again, I'm going to do another quick little tap here at the forge, and then I'm going to go right over to the uh, anvil. So, ready to head to the anvil. All right, we're almost up to temp now. So, go ahead and switch over the anvil cam, Jessica. Okay. And almost there, ladies and gents. Just give me a few little seconds more. So what I'm doing right now is I'm reducing the amount of air, but I'm trying to just puff the fire just a little bit to keep the heat up, but reduce the oxygen level. And so, like I said, I'm going to come right here to my swedge block first. Just make sure it's doubly welded there. Now I'll come over here and start welding down that little tab there. this is quite the trick with the size. All right, so now there's no further need for flux on this piece. You can start seeing that hopefully mm -hmm. build up there. There's no further need for that flux. This piece is welded. So we're going to take it up to welding heat again. We don't need it to continue to eat away at our steel at high temperatures. This piece is welded in. We'll go ahead and get it, get it good and hot again. And we'll continue to weld in that little nub on the end. Now let me see if I can't zoom you all in a little bit. Hope you all can see that really well. Yeah, that's pretty good. You can see that little nub there on the end. Mm -hmm. That's the portion we're welding in. So like I said, you can see with this dangly piece here, this is a good strong eight when it comes to forge welding. just because of the awkwardness. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if this wasn't having this little dangly bit, this would, like, it would be downgraded to maybe like a six or a five in forge welding. It wouldn't be that difficult. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back over. All right, uh, your cousin Johnson says, don't burn yourself, buddy. I'll try not to, John. That would hinder me from getting my gains, bud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for subscribing again. We appreciate you. God bless. Manga12 says, oh, when heating with a torch, should I use a reducing flame or a neutral flame? I notice if I hit the welding part of the tip, it starts mm -hmm. to cause the sparks to fly off instantly. But if I use the end of the flame, it's not heating quick enough. Uh, you'll want to use a neutral flame. Uh, you, there are certain times that you want to use a reducing flame. Uh, but, you know, if you're heating with a torch, you want neutral, the best you can. And then you're going to have to pick the happy medium between those two. Not too close and not too far away. All right. Yeah. So, let's segue if we can real quick. I want Jessica to tell you a little bit more about her blacksmith cheat sheet, the e-book there. Uh, and then I want to thank some... Uh, Thank everybody from the bottom of my heart, the people that have been contributing and super chat donations and PayPal donations and things like that. Uh, we've got a list of names like we do every live stream, and we want to make sure that we can that we thank those people for helping bring streams like this uh, to viewers like you. So segue over, Jessica. All right, <laughs> here we go. Oh, by the way, you might want to readjust your camera while I'm doing this. Um, okay. Yes. So for those of you who may be new to our channel, uh, we have our own website, and it's called blacksmithpdfs.com, and it drops you off at this page. Uh, it's just a portion of our total blacksmithing website. Um, but 
What you'll find here is our newest release is called the Blacksmith's Cheat Sheet, and it is on the second line, the very first um, first thing in that row. And uh, I have it labeled there as ebook, Blacksmith's Cheat Sheet. And also, if you um, are interested in getting everything we offer, we do have the All Plans bundle as well, which offers uh, basically everything every tool, every power hammer, uh, all the plans we've ever come out with, including the Blacksmith's Cheat Sheet, is there as well. If you're looking to sell online, the Blacksmith's Cheat Sheet is really going to help you out on this. Uh, I put a lot of time researching the keywords and the pricing. The pricing I based on Etsy with my research there, but the keywords are relevant, whether it's Etsy, your own website, uh, Google, I'm trying to think of all the different ones here. Um, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, yep, that's another one. Uh, so it's got, also it has variations in there. So um, things that are common and maybe some not so common variations that you can add to some of your projects that perhaps you're already doing. The second photograph here, uh, it does show you a close up. I'm not sure if I can get to it currently, but there is a second photograph and it kind of shows you what the format looks like and you can hover over that and see more information that way. Uh, this is not a tutorial. It does not show you how to make these 50 projects. It is simply the research I found to help you sell the items. And if you want to download it, uh, it is a download, it's a PDF, there's 30 pages to it. And you just scroll down here to the bottom and you press add to cart and that'll allow you to check out. And so that's what you need to know about that. Yeah. All right. Am I back on camera? You are back on camera. Good, okay. So while she's done that work, I'm going to be releasing a series of about 50 or so videos. Uh, some a little, a few more than that, uh, but they're all going to be kind of taken in all around that 50 items that she has on the blacksmith cheat sheet with some tutorials. So you'll have to add your own personal touches and flares. I'm going to do the more low end items uh, just for time's sake in my shop. I'm going to do the lower end items that can be obtained by the beginner and you can make them as elaborate and charge up from there as you want to charge more towards the higher end or the upper end of the price spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that'll be good there. Let me go ahead and mention some of these names now real quick because we are almost back up to a nice welding heat. We would be if I would uh, stop talking so much and actually crank on this. But All right, so for the last 30 days of Super Chats from 511 to uh, 51118, yeah, right? 30 days. 30 days back from now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had Big Dog Forge, Graham Pepper, Shepherd's Forge H, Brent Leg, Champ Ironworks, Ben Culp, Arsene Development, Basin Ironworks or Derek Smead, Billy Strong, Josh Wright, Peter Tricker, Techron Matic, Jeff Sandling, Jason Hill, Coffee's Forge, Landon, 35 millimeter showdown, uh, Darren at Energy Management, North, North County Forge, Evan Coughlin, 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 I think it's Coughlin, and Carol Johnson. So make sure that everybody gives them a hand clap and say, you know, tell them thank you in the comment section down below uh, for that. Like I said, that does help bring these streams uh, on Friday nights. And they also help out for the ones on Monday. So thank you all so much. Yes. Thank um, you all so very much you for are your frozen. super chat. So <laughs> yes, but thank you for your right. super chats. Hopefully you still heard Roy. Um, yeah. We do put our audio feed in differently. You are permanently frozen.